allow in a few minutes um, for people to join in us from um, the other panel. I can see um, participants are coming in as we speak. Um, our panelists are here. <clears throat> Unfortunately, uh, we are missing um, a panelist today. <clears throat> Uh, Felicita Baker uh, has um, um, emailed us this morning to let us know that unfortunately she's not able to join us. Uh, she's hoping to uh, secure um, one of her colleagues to come and join us today, but uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, anyhow, um, therefore, uh, we are going to start. Uh, as I said, uh, as we keep saying, we're doing really well with the timing, so uh, I don't want to take too much time away, <laughs> and then we can have more time for, for, for Q&A. Um, okay, so we can start now <clears throat> with the um, first speaker of uh, panel two. Uh, we are very, very pleased, uh, I'm personally very pleased to welcome uh, Inessa Agivayanis, um, who is a colleague at SOAS, a uh, friend, and uh, now she's also embarked on a, on a PhD studies uh, at SOAS, which is fantastic uh, for us. And um, uh, today, I think she'll present um, a, a paper, uh, sort of based a bit on her current research. Uh, and the title of her presentation is Polygamy Amongst the Swahili Speaking Zanzibaris in England. So welcome, Inessa, and I pass over to you now. Uh, to um, give us your presentation. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Yes, I'm Ines Ajivayanis. I'm a PhD candidate at SOAS and also um, at the same time um, a, a legal advisor at SOAS. Um, so very pleased. It's my first presentation here. So hopefully I'll know what I'm doing. But yes, um, I'm trying to share my screen. Can you see it or not really? Um, yes. Oh, uh, hold on one sec. We're just making you okay. co-host now. Okay. Um, yes. We'll make a co-host and then you can share your screen. All right. And it's good to see everybody and you know, here the first panel presentations are really great. Um, let me try now. Yes, can everybody see my presentation, yeah? Yes. All right, so I'm going to speak about polygamy uh, amongst the Swahili speaking Zanzibaris in England. And just trying to clarify, I know polygamy means, uh, you know, a, a male being married to numerous wives or a woman married to numerous husbands, but um, I'm going to use it uh, uh, instead of polygyny. Uh, so a male marrying more than one wife, yeah? and. Um, that's the way they've used it as well here in England, even in um, in some uh, government documents and everything. So I will use it that way. Yeah. So that's the first one. Um, now, just to um, locate the Zanzibaris in England, um, they migrated. They've been they've, they've been to me. I think there've been two uh, major waves of migration. The first one was in 1964 during the revolution, and some years after. And uh, initially, it was just the Sultan, the Sultan and his entourage. And uh, later, um, other people from Zanzibar migrated um, to all over the world because of uh, policies uh, such as forced marriages, nationalization, Africanization, political imprisonment that were taking place then. Um, and then um, the second uh, larger wave was uh, in the 1995, uh, uh, after the 1995 elections, and at, uh, those bloodshed was the first uh, multi-party election. There have been also other... Um, other times that people migrate, of course, but I'm not going to call them waves, you know, for employment, education, and things like those, but I'm not going to call them waves, yeah? Um, now, I'll talk about the law of marriage in Zanzibar. Now, Zanzibar uses, um, as you know, uh, Tanzania has two separate legal systems, yeah? And Zanzibar follows, um, just for uh, family issues, they follow Sharia law, so uh, marriage, divorce, uh, inheritance, and such things, yeah? Um, I'm going to use the word Islamic only marriages to mean marriages that um, only use the Islamic ceremony and no civil ceremony. Yeah? So you've got the Islamic only marriages that are monogamous, yeah, which are completely legal in Zanzibar, um, you know, valid and everything. And you've got the polygamous ones as well, which are completely valid as well, because in Zanzibar, um, I mean, in Islam, polyga polygamous marriages are allowed. Yeah. 
So that was just um, some sort of a background. And also it's not codified in Zanzibar. They just use um, the Islamic Sharia laws and Hadith and the Kathis uh, just use those to interpret when they're making decisions about, you know, divorces, inheritance and such things, yeah? Um, I'm going to talk just briefly about the marriage law in England. Um, so you've got the Marriage Act 1949. And uh, in order for a marriage uh, in England to be valid, it has to, um, to comply with the requirements. Yeah, there, there are many requirements, for example, on the venue, uh, you have to apply in advance to marry, you have to have a certificate, uh, you know, you all have to be present and, and those kind of things. Yeah? So the focus is really on the ceremony. Yeah? And uh, then you've got the Matrimonial Causes Act, yeah, which uh, I'm going to divide it into two. Yeah, so you've got marriages that take place in England, yeah, and that's section 11B. And if a marriage takes place in England, it cannot be polygamous. Yeah, uh, if it's polygamous, it's going to be a crime of bigamy. Yeah, so that's straightforward and very clear. But when a, when the marriage takes place in a country outside England, and if in that country polygamous marriages are valid legal marriages, such as in Zanzibar, for example, and actually the whole of the United, um, uh, sorry, United Republic of Tanzania, in that case, it's a bit different, and it's Section 11 um, D of the Matrimonial Causes Act. And it all depends on the capacity of the parties. Yeah, by capacity, uh, I mean the country where they're domiciled. Is it legal for them to enter into polygamous marriage? So, if someone who is domiciled in England and goes to Zanzibar to get married and enters into polygamous marriage, then uh, they don't have capacity, and that marriage is illegal in um, in in England. Yeah, but let us say somebody um, in Zanzibar enters into polygamous marriage, even if they lived there before, but at the time they got married. They, um, they were domiciled in Zanzibar and then they come back here and, you know, they entered into the poly polygamous marriage when they were um, when they were domiciled in Zanzibar, then that polygamous marriage, marriage will be very much valid in England as well, yeah? So that capacity is to do with the person getting married and the form is the type of marriage. And also the law sort of differentiates between the actual polygamous marriage where people are actually in a polygamous marriage and potential polygamous marriage where the place where they got married, uh, polygamous marriages are valid. Now, um, Islamic only marriages in England, so marriages that only use the Islamic ceremony and not the, the civil ceremony, yeah, they have been defined uh, through court cases and non, as non marriages. And more recently, in a ruling, I think it was last year, they were defined as non qualifying ceremony. This is because the focus is more on the ceremony than you know, the marriage life of the people. So, unlike, for example, void avoidable marriages, which have been um, clearly stipulated in regulations and uh, if a void, marriage is void or you know um, voidable then you know that there are people can get for example uh, financial orders when they divorce and things like that but with Islam but with Islamic marriages because they're considered nine marriages then the the court cannot issue any financial orders or anything to the people uh, getting divorced yeah and this is the case whether it's a uh, monogamous or polygamous marriages. Yeah. Now, with polygamous Islamic only marriages, these are not criminal in the UK. Yeah? They are not uh, bigamy. Yeah. They, because the marriage itself is not recognized as a marriage. So, if somebody gets married only using Islamic um, ceremony, even up to even if they have four wives, they're not committing any crime because, as far as the law in England is concerned, they're not married at all. So. Um, I'll quickly just go into the reasons that I found out in my research and why people uh, enter into polygamous marriages here in England. And then I'll get back to the issue of, uh, of uh, polygamy and um, with Islamic marriages only here. Anyways, the reasons I found out, one was religion, yeah? There are people who, you know, who are very religious and who feel like they cannot enter into any sexual activity or have children if they're not married, yeah? And it turns out that at the time that maybe they want to settle down, have children, the person who who is available to, to get married to is already in a polygamous marriage, yeah? So a number of, of, of the women I spoke to that entered into such uh, marriages here because of that. Another reason that many women actually gave me was the flexibility. A lot of them living in the Western world, they've got their own homes, uh, they've got a certain lifestyle, they're friends, they want to go out, you know, they want to have time to read their books in bed sometimes, some days where they don't need to cook for anybody. So having a husband who's there maybe two, three times a week, provides them this flexibility with the life that they want to live. Especially, um, I've noticed um, a lot of educated women gave me that reason. Yeah, People who've got their, what 
you know, who are professionals and um, yeah, they gave me that reason. Another reason I found uh, a number of women entered into these polygamous marriages here, the Zanzibari women, was vulnerability. Yeah? Many of them who especially have been divorced or widowed, they feel like um, they need um, protection and uh, sort of guidance from a husband. And, you know, once they're not married, they feel like they, they're very vulnerable and people will take advantage of them. And so they need uh, a husband to look after them. Now, into my findings, um, I found that, uh, <clears throat> like I said earlier, uh, the polygamous marriages that are entered into through Islamic only ceremonies are not criminal in the UK because they're not marriages, they're not recognized as legal marriages in the first place. But when I interviewed the women, I realized that they lack that knowledge and they think they're actually um, committing a crime and doing something wrong by entering into polygamous Islamic only marriages. And so they live this life where, you know, the child, uh, the father will not be entered into the child's uh, birth certificate. Um, they will, so they will not have any, uh, they cannot enforce any rights from the father on their children, for example, on maintenance or anything, yeah? Because they feel like, you know, they're doing something wrong. They've got to, it can't be known that, you know, they've married someone who's already married, you know, that it's a crime they feel. And uh, it, it, it causes a lot of um, stigma I felt on, uh, on the children as well, because you know they've got a birth certificate that says pretty much um, that yeah, you know your father is unknown. And then another thing I found out is that uh, when I through my reading, a lot of um, Muslim communities here in England they use Sharia councils when they want to get divorced. Yeah, but it was interesting that the Zanzibari women are not using the Sharia councils. They're actually using you know the Imam or in, in Tanzania we call them as uh, we call them Sharia. Yeah? They just got to them, and uh, so this is the case where the husband refuses to issue to pronounce the Islamic divorce. Yeah, so they don't go to the Sharia council and they go to the Imam. And uh, well, we'll speak about the reasons maybe why they do that. Yeah, another thing I found out that was a bit different from the other communities here is that a lot of uh, from my reading, a lot of the other uh, Islamic communities here in the in, in England and in the whole of the UK. They tend to marry, for example, the Bangladeshi, Pakistanis, they tend to marry women who, um, the men tend to marry women who are in their countries, in their home countries. And so they have to uh, sponsor them to move to the UK. And it, become, it becomes very difficult because in the law in the UK, you can only sponsor one spouse at a time. Yeah. So if you've got a spouse that you're still married to, who is still uh, living, who you sponsored, you cannot sponsor another spouse yeah, until you know they're diseased or you know you're divorced. So a lot of polygamous, uh, it's difficult for polygamous marriages in that way. Even if it's a legally uh, valid polygamous marriage in England, like I was saying, if the person had capacity to enter into that marriage, it's the law is still that they cannot sponsor more than one wife. So that makes it difficult. But with Zanzibaris, uh, the ones I've interviewed, they tend to marry women who are already uh, Zanzibaris as well, but they're already in the UK, so they don't need to sponsor them. And um, I think only one had issues with migration. The rest didn't really have that issue, which I thought was quite different from, from the other uh, Muslim communities here in England. Um, now, before I go into it's my concluding remarks, but um, so one thing is that Islamic only polygamous marriages are a reality in England, yeah, and the, they will continue to be so in terms of you know the the Islamic uh, women, and uh, them not them not knowing that this is, for example, not criminal, um, they can't enforce rights for their children. It actually affects their agency a lot, yeah. Like I said, they're unable to register their children. They, um, you know, all these things, yeah. They're unable to ask for support from them. They're unable to ask them to look after the children as well on some days because there's nothing that says that they're the father. So it really affects their agency as well as their citizenship in terms of uh, enforcing their rights as citizens. So um, it's, it's a question really, but I wonder if um, non-recognizing um, or not giving them some sort of protection, them understanding one, they're not committing a crime and you know giving them that education and protection, um, that would I think um, help a lot more than just not talking about it and you know, um, thinking, oh, let them think that, uh, you know, this is all illegal, don't get into this, because they will get into this. So yeah, it feels like it's a lot worse in terms of um, the society. I didn't check how long I've taken, um, but run really quickly. Yes, you've got a few more minutes left. You've got okay. uh, five minutes. Okay. To be honest, that's all I wanted to talk. I wanted to just add one more thing. Uh, I found out... Um, when I interviewed these women, there's a lot of confusion, for example, on uh, in Swahili, we call it Eda. I think it's pronounced Ida here, yeah? Um, 
so when a woman is divorced, for example, or uh, if her husband is diseased, they have to stay for a certain period, yeah, before the divorce is final, or if it's a if it's a widow, you know, for them to reflect on what has happened and everything. If it's a widow, it's uh, four months and ten days, and if it's a divorcee, it's um, three periods, yeah. So three menstrual periods, and then they're officially divorced, yeah. But uh, there's a lot of confusion with Zanzibaris. So this is how you know Islam says, and how many women from what I've read, who are not Zanzibaris, for example, Bangladeshi, Pakistanis, that's what they know and that's what's in the Quran. But I noticed that with the Zanzibaris here, yeah, there was a lot of confusion. Some women who got divorced um, stayed in Edda for like four months and 10 days, which is a lot more than what they're required to. And they're explaining to me that that's how they saw their parents do it in Zanzibar. So um, I'm realizing that there are some cultures that, are, well, it's Islamic laws, that they're carrying from Zanzibar and bringing into uh, here, but uh, you know, it, it, over here it's not seen by the other Muslim communities as the way it should be. Um, I, I just also wanted to explain on why I've just used England. It's because um, like Tanzania, you know, they're separate legal systems. We've got England and Wales, um, and now it's becoming more England because um, there's devolved parliament and everything. So I wanted to explain that, uh, but I think that's it for me. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Inessa, for a very interesting presentation, uh, very fascinating research you are currently doing. And uh, we're looking forward to yeah, hearing more as you progress with your, with your research. Um, now, um, as, a, as, as for the previous panel, we will take the, the question and answer at the end of the session, but please do write the, uh, your question in the Q&A chat. Um, so that you don't forget them. <laughs> um, as I said, because of uh, uh, Felicity Baker is not able to join us, um, we are now moving on to the third speaker. They actually follows on quite well from Inessa's presentation. Um, uh, Inessa, may I just ask you to may perhaps stop sharing? Uh, yes, so that um, Shabani, uh, we can uh, welcome Shabani. Um, on the platform. And uh, Shabani Mwakilanga uh, is going to present uh, um, a paper entitled He Sharia in Ashida Sana, the Law of Marriage Act of 1971, um, Muslims and the demand for Qadi courts in Tanzania in the uh, 1970s uh, to the 2010. So as I said, you know, it follows really nicely on Ines' presentation in terms of topic. And uh, so welcome Shabani, uh, you have 20 minutes uh, to present your paper, um, so yes, thank you. Uh, are okay. you going to Are you going to present? Let yes, I'm, I'm. I'm going to share my screen. But uh... okay, so uh, wait one second. That will make you co-host. Okay. Uh, just give us a second. There you okay. go. Uh, your co-host now, so you can share your your presentation. Thank you. Okay. Can you all see that? Yes. Oh. Yeah, we can see it. <laughs> Thank you, Angelica, and thank you, Inesa, for a very good presentation, which in a way, of course, speaks a lot to my project also that I've been doing in Tanzania as part of a large project in my PhD. Uh, so my presentation is about the really the complaints about the Muslims or agita Muslim agitations about the uh, law of marriage of 1971 in the way how it affect Islamic religion in general in Tanzania. So, so my study is, is, as I said, is covering most of the Tanzanian part, but my, most of the area that I visited are in the coast area of Tanzania, in Tanga, Dar es Salaam, Morogoro, Lindi, Mtwara, and in Songea. And I've been traveling also in Dodoma and, uh, and Mbeya and some places where I met some people and conducted a number of interview to, you know, to, in, as a part of my PhD project. So that's why what I'll be speaking will be the idea obtained from the data collected from the, uh, the whole party of the country. Now, I use the archival sources uh, all interviews, I've interviewed a lot of people, Christian and Muslim, scholars, normal Muslim, 
for those who know Tanzania or Dar es Salaam, people from Buguruni, those people who are coming from a very normal background who sometimes are just Muslim by name. And also I paid much attention to online sites and social media. Now, I particularly choose this forum forums because in Tanzania now, there is a much wider spread of the use of social media. So some people are very expressive in this social media and you can get a lot of ideas of what it is going on. Now, the problem of this technique is that sometimes it's difficult to know who is who in the social media. And since also we have this existence of fake accounts, you find some, that sometimes people who are using fake accounts, the same person can have like four different accounts using different names. So it's really difficult to discern who exactly is speaking about this. Sometimes those people who are scholars use normal use names which are very normal and sometimes you can mistake them to be like uh, a normal kind of Muslim who is just uh, a flight Muslim, but at the same time you'll find that it's not. So as you say, I, I tried to, to deal with this and uh, in a way that's why I came up with this idea. So in, in, a, in a background that before the passing of the law of marriage in 1971, Tanzania had in several laws which were dealing with uh, the aspect of marriage and the divorce. And each community had light. Also, I would say had an, a large percent of freedom on how to deal with marriage and divorce in pertaining their members. So Hindus were, had their own laws, state laws, for example, the Hindu was the marriage, divorce, the marriage, divorce and succession and ashatic ordinance of 1923. It had been changed here and there, but until independence, it was still applicable. Christians were using the, the Law of Marriage Act ordinance of 1929. It was still in, in, in effect even after independence until 1971 was, it was repealed. Also Muslim. Now, Muslim and non-Christian Africans they used what we call the customary law. And this one was not codified until 1971. So each tribe, uh, each school of uh, each, each group of Muslim that Shia, uh, Sunni, and uh, Abadia, they all tailored their own way of dealing with marriage and the divorce in a way. Now, this has a lot of problems, which later on read to the government to decide to sit down and think and introduce the law of marriage. But that not only those a problem, which I've tried to show that, but also there's a, that we call international influence, which led to the, uh, uh, to the enactment of the Tanzania law of marriage. And this comes from two parts. The first influence came from Kenya, this came in 1967 when Kenya decided to create a uniform law of marriage and divorce in Kenya. So it's, it seemed that what, what was happening in Kenya in relation to the creation of this law of marriage was much followed in a country like Tanzania and Uganda in a way, because you find later on both three East African countries embarked on the creation of the uniform law of marriage. But it was only Tanzania which succeeded to pass the law in 1971 uh, ahead of Kenya and, and Uganda. And the second, uh, the second reason in international influence was the United Nations Organization. The United Nations Organization passed a resolution in 1965 uh, in the general, it's called the General Assembly Resolution 20, 2018 in bracket C20, which, which was titled Recommendation on the Consent to Marriage, Minimum Age for Marriage, and Registration of Divorce. In this recommendation, the United Nations recommended to its member state that the, the minimum age for marriage should be 15 years. 
So it seems Tanzania as a member was duty bound to make sure that they try to implement this into their legal system and, that, and it showed that it should be accepted in the judicial system so that it can be used uh, as it, it was uh, recommended. The second uh, reason was Tan, Tanu's policy. As for those who are familiar with the history of Tanzania, after independence since 1961, Tanu has been trying so much to unify the Tanzanians. Or I should say from 1954 when Tanu was, uh, was formed. For example, we have uh, slogans and sayings, normally we could say misemo uh, or methali. For example, uhuru na umoja, unit, uh, freedom and the unit. Then we have the, a slow, uh, the saying which goes like, umoja ni nguvu, utengane ni udhaifu, that unit is strength and uh, division is weakness. So this kind of slogans and say were embedded in Tanu policies before independence and after independence. So after the attainment of independence, Tanu was keen to make sure that they walk the talk. So from 1961, Tanu tried to do a lot of things to pass a lot of laws which showed that Tano intended to bring unit. For example, uh, in 1962, Tano abolished gender discrimination in education and integrated the education in Tanzania. So you see, this was to make sure that all the people were one. It doesn't care the racial, religious affiliation or ethnic affiliation that people they had. In 1963, Tanu passed a law, which you called the Magistrate Law of 1963, which unified the judicial system in Tanzania. Before that, there was a two system of judicial, the one which were dealing with native, which was the local laws, local courts, and the one which were dealing with uh, uh, Christians, so we call the Indians, Asian, and whites, uh, and, and Europeans. So they had the high court uh, when they were under the high court. So, in 1966, they unified the, uh, the judicial system to have a three-tier system from the primary court, district court, uh, magistrate court, to the high court, so that it should people, all people should be treated equally in the unified legal system. In 1965, Tan also abolished multi-party democracy and opted for a single, a single party democracy. All this showed that Tan police was to make to remove things that they deemed to bring this unit among Tanzania and, and to, unify, to unify the people. And the last problem, uh, the last thing was the problem now ex existed in the previous laws. First, there are too many, like four different laws defining the people of the same country and treating them unequally. For example, Muslim and uh, native Africans. So, so Muslim and non-Christian Africans who married in customary law and Islamic law their cases were decided in the primary court. But if you go to non-Christian Asians, Christians, their cases were decided by the high court. So this created something like a discrimination among the people. And in a way, people started to feel that they are not equal. And the Tanu police was to make sure that all people were equal. By the time in 1967, they adapted to Yama. So the aim really was to make sure that those feelings which tended to divide the people were eliminated. That's why Tanu decided to pass the law. In order to pass the law, Tanu in 1969 published the so-called the proposal for the formation of the uniform law of marriage in Tanzania. And the white paper, the government paper number one of 1969. This law has one big aim, to integrate and reform law related to marriage and divorce in Tanzania. So all the number of those that I've tried to mention, they wanted to integrate them and reform them in a way they should fit, first with Tanu police, as say, with international recommendation, and also to, 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 to remove those problems. And this, the, the white paper suggestion can be grouped into three subgroups. The one was suggestion which intended to protect women and children. And in this, you find that Tano suggests that a minimum age should be 15. Now, this, though it was going together with the recommendation of the United Nations, but also Tano wanted to protect the health of young girls who were married very young, sometime at the age of eight or nine, 
because by the time for a girl to get married, the first what he was needed was the consent of the parent. If the father agree, then nothing would, could spot, stop that kind of marriage. But also the girl was married at puberty. So sometime eight years, nine years, the, it, was, it was not defined. So many girls who were married at that particular young age tended to die because of pregnancy complication, birth complication. I think that I so turn of it that it was high time now to try to protect uh, girls, but also to protect the women. And for example, those women who were living with men for a longer time, like say for two years, for three years, without a former marriage. By the time a man get tired with that woman, they just leave them without anything, without saying anything. So the turn of felt that no, we should protect these women by introducing so-called presumption of marriage or no ayakuchukulia. So in this, it was said that if a woman, if a man and a woman live together for more than two years and acquire a status to be recognized as husband and wife, that marriage will be legally recognized if he debuted at the court. So what a woman need was just to go to the court to say, I've been living with this man for three years and we've been doing a lot of things and people know that is husband and wife and that was recognized as marriage, whether it was formally celebrated or it was not formally contacted. But also there was this presumption of death that if a man is absent for five years without any communication, the law allowed people to presume that he's dead and to give the woman the right to continue with her life, whether to get married or to, to do anything. The other one was unification. Now on the unification, the, the law, the proposal suggested to unify two important things. First, Registration of marriage, because previously each group had its own books for to register marriage, the regist, regist, registrar book. But now they decided to say, okay, we should have only one regist, book, marriage registration, registration system so that it will be easy to trace those issues related to marriage. And the last one to promote gender equality to women. And this was to uplift women. And that's where we say, one of the most important comment about this, that this was very progressive in the sense that it allowed a lot of freedom to women which were not there before. For example, now women were allowed to sue for adultery also, if adultery occurs. So women also were able to sue the woman who committed adultery with their husbands. But also we see the women also were free to, to start matters related to divorce without, uh, without any problem because before they were not allowed and it was really, really discouraged like that. For example, in Islam, if a woman seek divorce, then she has to buy it. But the law made it illegal for women to start to seek divorce if she feels that like she's not free and the marriage has a problem. Now, after this proposal and, you know, the government asking people to give their uh, comments and suggestions, and many people gave. Christian had a mixed feelings. First, they accepted most of the proposal, but they opposed the issue of the convention of marriage because the law, the law wanted uh, men to be free to convert monogamous marriage into polygamous marriage. Uh, Christian felt that this was not those interference with Christian religion, which teach their people that one wife, one husband, one wife. So Christian was not happy with this one, but also people, uh, Christians opposed the presumption, uh, the concept of presumption of marriage, that if the government will allow presumption of marriage, then it will allow many Christian men to get into extramarital uh, affairs so that later on that kind of affair should be recognized as marriage. So they were, they were not happy with those two areas. Muslims, uh, there's a big debate going on now, and it was there before that Bakwata, which is, was a uh, recog uh, recognized Muslim body for all, all over in Tanzania, and especially for Sunni Muslim, didn't participate in the general process of giving comments and opinions when the law was passed. And this, 
that's the said today that led that that's why the law has a lot of problem which affect Muslim than other groups of uh, of community in Tanzania. But in this comment, the Shia is naturally oppose this law, and they load their proposal uh, to 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 protect uh, to be, to oppose this law, and they load a number of things. First, they said the. Uh, they wanted the government to maintain the system that existed before. They were not really happy because they felt that the government was interfering with that. And the fact that the government could have worked on the previous system than change it and create a uniform of, of uniform law of marriage. And they, they, in one saying, they said that the government should let hand, thousand brooms, uh, a thousand flower broom than creating a single color for all the flowers. So the aim was to make sure that they go back and the fact that the government was, was not happy. Now, there is this suggestion that why Shia was so active than the Bakwata. First, Bakwata was just formed like two years ago, uh, two years before, after the abolition of the East African Muslim Warfare Society. So in terms of Bakwata was trying to build itself in the country and it was not, ready to try to antagonize the government which came with the proposal but for the shia it was it was important for them to struggle first they were the well organized most of them were indians so well organized well educated they have a lot of lawyers people who could understand the implication of the new law and tried to 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 object to that now the in response to these comments when the government passes the law it allowed uh, the Christian uh, objection of not allowing Christian marriage to convert convert their marriage from monogamy to polygamy, but also allowed Muslim not to seek permission from their wife when they want to take uh, more wives in the marriage because they are Muslim marriage, Islam, Muslim marriage are polygamous in nature. So the, the government first said they should ask permission to their wife. When the wife consent, they should do that. But now the government said, okay, don't do that. It's okay. But the last one was that it recognized Islamic system of verbal repudiation to form a talaka, but still created a system that there must be some procedure to be followed for that. For example, to go to the marriage reconciliation board, to go there to be reconciliated. Well, after the reconciliation failed, then the husband was allowed to give talaka, then to go and register it to the court. Now, after the passing of the law, now when the law started to operate, a number of problems was seen. For example, the law didn't recognize Muslim divorce. And this was in a matter of interpretation in the court. Eh? So the law now started to dictate the way Muslim should do divorce. Because now Muslim was used that if you want to divorce your wife, you just say, for example, from today you are not my wife. That was stand as a complete divorce by itself. Now in the court, those uh, verbal repudiation started not to hold any water and it became very, a big problem. Muslim, some women took their husband to the court to complain that they are not maintaining us. And when you go to court, the husband say, I divorced her and there's no evidence because it was just a simple repudiation. So it caused a lot of problem. Also, the court now became the only organ that has a final say when it came to divorce. Oh, I don't know, I'm running out of time? Uh, no, just to say that you have one minute left. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I can give you, we can give you two minutes. Thank you. For okay. So another problem with that, uh, Muslim felt that the law went against the, the way of Muslim to contact their marriage. For example, the law forced Muslim required the Muslim to give a 21 day notes before contacting marriage so that the marriage should be public and everyone should hear so that if there is objection, people can go there. But the second problem is that marriage now are supposed to be contacted to the or solemnized to only licensed sheikhs, kadis, and warim. And this is limiting option among the Muslim who felt that in, in Islamic religion, they are free to contact marriage to anybody as long given that they are Muslim and they are land Muslim sheikhs. So it's way it limits them their capacity to conduct marriage anywhere unless they find those licensed sheikhs. <clears throat> it's also allow uh, marriage deems unlawful for, by allowing the presumption of marriage. 
and also it promotes moral decay because by limiting the age for girls to get marriage at 15, they say that some girls start you know, being involved in, extra, in sexual activities before that age. And since they are not forbidden, the law forbid them to get married, so it caused uh, a bit of, of uh, a problem. Now, oh, for the third minute, my conclusion. <clears throat> in all this, you we see two important things. First is the, the struggle between religion and secularism to control personal matters of the people uh, in Tanzania. Uh, while religion feel that marriage and divorce is a matter which should is a very matter with a delicate matter which should be ended by religion secular state also feel that it's time also it's have a hand so that to control the freedom that religion has which is sometimes undermine the light of some individuals who of course should have right to to choose what they want if they want to have many wife or they don't want to have wife or to have uh, to have a polygamous ma marriage or a monogamous marriage, but also it showed gender differences because many women supported this uh, this law and still are supporting, and many men are opposing it in a way because they feel that it took some of their freedom, some of their right which they had before, and gave women power. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Shabani, for your presentation. Excellent. And then you would um, you also stay within the time. Very good <laughs> for the chair, very important. And now uh, we are very pleased to say that uh, um, Felicity uh, Baker um, is not here, as I said, but uh, her colleague uh, um, is with us, um, Salvatore Niando. Niando. Niento, sorry, apologies, yeah. Salvatore Niento. Uh, are you here with us? Uh, I saw you just now. Uh, sorry, bear us with us a few moments while we try to uh, see if he's still with us. Uh, okay, so perhaps um, uh, because uh, Salvatore is probably having uh, some issues at the moment. So let's move to Melvin. And then um, uh, we go back. Ah, no, here we go. Here we go. Uh, apologies, Melvin. Apologies, everyone. Okay. So, Salvatore Nianto is here with us. Uh, I can see, yeah, you have your hand raised. So, if you want to start, and then we keep the order. So, then Melvin, uh, you will come in after Salvatore. That's okay. Sorry for all this uh, um, confusion. Okay, Salvatore, uh, I think you can start. Uh, hello, are you getting me? Yes, uh, you need to take your uh, 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 lower your hand. Okay. Uh, lower okay. The, there you go. And then, uh, yes, we can hear you. Oh, thank you so much. I will, uh, well, first of all, good. Uh, uh, is, it, is, is it in the morning? Uh, here we are uh, midday, 12.30, midday. Uh, Oh, okay, okay, good afternoon. So, uh, we, so sorry uh, to say, we can't see you. We can only see an image of you, uh, but it's up to you if you want to keep the image or maybe you can try to uh, make a, uh, a video. Uh, unfortunately here, uh, the internet connection isn't good. Okay. So, so if you don't mind, I may just present it as it is with, uh, yeah. with the video, in fact, muted. Absolutely, that's absolutely fine. Thank okay, you so, much. so I, I would like to, oh, well, first of all, thank you so much for your understanding. And I would like to, to share my screen. How do I go about sharing my- Yes, that's fine. <laughs> um, uh, my colleague Aki will make you a host. Okay. Just one minute. Um, and then once you are a co-host, you will be able to share. Okay. Thank you.
Uh, hello, Angelica. Yes, we are trying. Uh, apologies. Okay. Oh, well, it's okay. Uh, for some reason, there is an issue um, because you have been um, added to the panel uh, from a different way, and okay. uh, it looks like we are not able to do the co-host. Would you mind uh, talking through? Is there a problem? Oh well, it's okay. No problem. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's been some technical issue because okay. of the way you're doing it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so uh, thank you so much for, uh, for all the presenters. And, uh, and also thank you so much for such an invitation. Uh, it's, uh, it's an honor to be part of this, uh, of this discussion. Of course, unfortunately, uh, Professor Baker uh, would be with us. And uh, uh, our paper is a co-authored paper about shame, uh, history, and slave antecedents. What does it mean that the slave past is Jambo Laibu? And uh, because my colleague uh, isn't here, so I will only present uh, one part of the paper. And, I should, uh, and we should also admit that our paper is still in, is still in progress. So our study centers on Tabora in Western Tanzania and Lindi in Southern Tanzania. And for the sake of this presentation, I present uh, the first part of this, of this paper about Western Tanzania. So Tabora town was uh, strategically located at the junction of the trade routes from the interior uh, to the East African coast. And as a, as a junction of the major trade routes, the town developed as an, as an important center of trade and slavery in the uh, 19th and 20th century. Slaves in Unyamwezi originated from Unyamwezi, central Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda and Burundi and parts of, parts of East African and parts of the East African interior including the Manyema region, which was known as, as the richest in slaves in 19th century. In many ways, societies regard slave, slavery and its resultant implications as shameful because slavery is associated with humiliation and torture, talking to people of, of slave descent and elders about their slave past becomes a challenging task because stories of this sort tend to arouse vexing feelings in the society. Some elders choose to remain silent when asked about the slave past for the fear that they would damage their social positions. To maintain their social reputation, some elders of slave descent remain skeptical of revealing to researchers about their slave past. The manner in which shame unfolds itself in the society it shape, is shaped by the context, perceptions, memories of slavery, and individual and collective experiences of the formerly enslaved people in post-slavery society. The varied experiences of slavery disguise stories and consequently shape the way they are told to researchers, dis descendants of the, of, of the enslaved, and the society at large. So our paper rely, relies on mission registers and interviews. As for mission registers, we rely on the mission registers of adult and young baptism collected from the private archives and libraries of Western Tanzania in order to show the various manifestations of shame in a slave society. In particular, we seek to show how names of the formerly enslaved adults who converted to Christianity could be used as analytic category to probe into shame, history, and slave antecedents of post-slavery societies. The recollections about slavery show how aibu, or shame in English, has shaped the way stories of slavery is told and appropriated in their day-to-day -day undertakings. Shame in Western Tanzania 
unfolded itself in different forms in 19th and the 20th century. It was under, the society understood the, understood aibu or shame depending on context, interaction and the gravity of the issue at hand. Slavery by all accounts was shameful was a shameful attribute that residents, descendants of slaves and former slave owners distanced themselves from talking about it. What accounts for the wide ne neglect of talking about stories of slavery stems from sufferings, intimidations, and torture whose effects lingered in the society in 20th century Unyamwezi. Their effects dictated societal perceptions of the enslaved as weak, strangers, and second-class citizens who were deprived of access to land, ritual, ritual performance, and social recognition. Because of the sufferings embedded in slavery, societies drew negative perceptions on slaves and often treated them as generally properties of owners. The less relevance of, sla of slavery reflected the names assigned to slaves whose meaning are worth looking at as we probe into the post-slavery era in Western Tanzania and Lindi. The names, for instance, of Abraham Mgawa, which means one who is hated, and, and, and Daniel Kugawa, which means to be hated, appearing on the parish registers of the Moravian missions suggest that although the two slaves converted to Christianity, their birth names impeded their quest for incorporation and socializing as members of Christian community in Western Tanzania. Dislikes, anxieties, and hatred remain important in the society despite conversion to Christianity. Now, the second part of this paper talks about the struggle for social recognition. Now, slaves devised various mechanisms to bring to an end shame, dislikes, and contempt ingrained in the society. Some slaves resorted to traveling to distant villages where they were completely unknown in order to hide their shame in Kiswahili Kuficha Aibu. Others took names of influential leaders and individuals in the society. For instance, names such as Mukombe, translated in English as messenger or carriers of message, were dominant among the formerly enslaved people to challenge the negative connotations, scorn, and intimidations ingrained in the society regarding slavery. In Unyamwe society, Vakombe or Bakombe were carriers of messages of chiefs about war, drought, invasions, chiefly meetings, or any other event that needed immediate intervention in the society. Therefore, becoming Mukombe was a way of challenging the idioms of uneasiness of slavery. Others, however, struggled for recognition by adopting the name Safisha in response to the dominant discourses of, slave, of slavery and post-slavery experiences. The name Safisha was derived from the Kinyamwezi Kutema to mean initiators of new settlements in Unyamwezi. As new chiefs or as new inhabitants, the formerly enslaved people cleared bushes, initiated, initiated settlements, and bound communities together by maintaining robust networks of friendship support and social cohesion. For some slaves, associating with the chiefly line and influential people in the society was a way of disguising shame. Because chiefs commanded respect from the people, slaves aspired to be part of their families. The birth name appearing on the registers as Mnuasele is, indic is indicative of the ways in which slaves could hide their shame through adopting names of chiefs in Unyamwezi. The name Unwasele, adopted by Johanna Masesa, shows that he was not part of the chiefly family, but he took the name of Unyamwezi chief Unwasele 
in order to hide his slave past and in order to be assimilated into the chiefly line. By becoming Munuasele, Masesa became part of the chiefdom and could, could command respect to the, to the society. He had become part of the family of, of Mtemi Munuasele. Some slaves, however, took names of influential traders in Unyamwezi as they rest, as they struggled against the binaries entrenched in the societies. For instance, names like Mlungwana or Kalungwana translate. In, Swahili, in English as, and Leonard Manua show that slaves struggled for recognition. Hello? Hello, are you getting me? Hello, Angelica? Yes. Are you, uh, sh sh should I go on? Uh, yes, you have, uh, you have another 10 minutes. Oh, oh thank you. Yes, so, yes. Some slaves, however, took names of influential traders in society. For instance, names like Mlungwana or Kalungwana, translated as civilized, assigned to the two slaves, Rode and Leonard Mumanwa, show that slaves struggled for recognition that distinguished them from slavery to a recognizable status in the society. The names seem to suggest that the two slaves resorted to using the two names to distinguish themselves from Vasenzi in Kiswahili Washenzi, translated in English as uncivilized. In Unyamwezi, the reputation Valungwana was initially used to mean accumulating wealth to establish oneself as an independent trader, to gain the ability to marry, to acquire livestock, and to purchase slaves to work in one's household. As portrayed to call in Unyamwezi, an occupational group that is the, the Vandeva emerged as the civilized or free gentlemen whose wealth provided them a new source of power. By contrast, those who are not gone to the coast, who could not communicate more in Kinyamwezi than in uh, 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 who, who could communicate more in Kinyamwezi than in Kiswahili, were often called savages and barbarians over Senzi. In some instances, some slaves resorted to adopting names of their former owners to be assimilated to the post-slavery community because slave owners enjoyed socioeconomic positions in the society. Slaves had a conviction that by taking their names, they would also ascend to the social hierarchy. For instance, the name Warabu appearing on the entries of Dorothea Kalunde and Nelly Cesia suggest two issues. One, it suggests that their parents, Salomo Marabu and Malko Marabu, were former slaves of an Arab slave owner. But second, it, it suggests that they adopted the nickname of their owners in order to end social recognition in the society. For slaves who converted to Christianity, to Christianity and Islam, adoption of new names was also a means of embracing new culture and civilization in Kiswahili Ustarabu they had encountered. Vexed by the binaries and content, slaves suspended the use of, the, the use of their birth names, especially names like Mlekwa or Kalekwa, which means an orphan or an abandoned person in favor, in favor of Christian names such as Elizabeth, Elia, Cecilia, Eva, Eva and Emma, to mention just a few examples. While a, number of, while a number of slaves struggled for social recognition by adopting names of influential leaders and individuals in Unyamwe society, others instead adopted names that signified acceptance of the trauma, intimidations, and the contempt in grade in, in slavery. For instance, the name Mzumia, which translated as one who accepts, assigned it to Elizabeth Kalekwa Mzumia and Helena Simbo Mzumia and Lucas Mfalila Mzumia, suggests that while a significant number of slaves in Unyamwezi struggled for social recognition, often using overt and covert strategies, others instead accepted their slave past 
and openly demonstrated this through naming. The dominance of female slaves with names Umzumia in the baptism register further suggests to reiterate what Jan George George had argued that there were more they were more docile than women than men. Further, the name Tulikuvangi, translated in Swahili or in English as we are in the foreign land, appearing, appearing on the register of Salome, or the baptismal register of Salome implies that she maintained her slave past through naming as a slave uh, from the East African interior who was formerly enslaved in Unyamwezi. While she converted to Christianity and subsequently became Salome, she did not feel uneasy to get rid of her slave antecedent in post-slavery Unyamwezi. As I said earlier, our work is still in progress. So we are still working on the subject matter and we do hope therefore this discussion will enrich our understanding of slavery and shame in post-abolition Tanzania. And I have also stressed that uh, for the sake of, of this discussion and because my colleague um, isn't available, I'll therefore present the first section of, of, uh, of, of, of our paper, leaving aside uh, the, second, the second part of, of this paper that talks about Lindy in Southern Tanzania. And having said all this, thank you so much. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, we are sorry that we were not able to share it. Um, mm -hmm. I have our wonder if you could uh, email it to us and then okay. we can share it uh, with the audience. Would that be okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, you can email it to either myself or Ida. Okay. And then uh, we can share it with the audience. That, that would oh, be really you. nice. Um, okay, so uh, we're moving on now to the final uh, presentation uh, of this panel, uh, and then we will uh, start to take the, the question from the audience. In the meantime, as we are uh, uh, moving toward the end, uh, please do put your questions in the Q&A box, uh, and I will pick them from there, uh, as well as uh, raising your hand if you want to speak, but you can also uh, simply put it in the Q&A chat as well. Um, as well, not, sorry, in the Q and A box, not in the chat. So there's been a little, little bit of a box, not in the chat. Okay, so, so, little, 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 little. okay Mel, so Mel, 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 Uma, yes, Mel, Uma, yes, yes. Okay, sorry, I can hear myself speaking. Uh, okay, so uh, the floor is all yours. Do you uh, have a presentation to share? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. So we'll make you a co-host right now. Um, so yes. Aki, if you could please make, there you go. Um, I think you're close now and you can share your presentation. You have, um, yes, uh, 20, 25 minutes. Thank you. Okay, uh, sorry, I'm trying to find it. Um, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, just a minute, just a minute. It's fine. Oh, this is taking forever. I... Um, is he, um, do you think is the connection? Uh, I'm just wondering whether it's the connection. I had, I had tried it before during the practice session and it was working just fine. I don't know. I seem not to be able to find the document and I, I wouldn't want to take much of your time. I saw I'm trying to rotate the camera to, to capture the 
the PowerPoint. I don't know whether it's visible. I don't know whether it can be seen. Uh, yes, um, a little bit, a little bit. Yeah. Okay. I don't know whether yeah. this will be helpful instead of taking much of your time, sadly, to look for it. Yes, that's fine. <clears throat> you can read it. Um, I was meant to read the title. You can read. I was meant to read the title. Uh, yeah, the title. Nitoa na wasilisha kwa kiswahili. Kwa majina, nitoa Melvin Oumba. Mwanafunzi wa uzamifu. Kiki candidate ya tuwa university. Ni nashukuru sana patafusa ya kuwa wasilisha katika ajukuwa hili. Kazi hili, diyo mwanzo tu naanza. It is part of my PhD project. Uh, which has uh, the data collection has just uh, kicked off. And so this platform will be an opportunity for me to grow this work even as I continue uh, with the PhD journey. Na wasilisho langu ni wakatika luga ya kiswahili, ambapo mada ni athari ya utamaduni katika uteuzi wa luga inye utumiwa na wanaume hospitalini kutafusha huduma za afya. Uh, na kazi hii ina mahususi kazi nzima inazungu, inashugulikia mawasiliano hospitalini uh, wakati ambapo wanaume wametembelea vituo vya afya kutafuta huduma za afya ya uzazi uh, ambayo nimetafuta kwa kuingereza reproductive health na uh, kila ambacho ninaangazia hapa ni kwamba katika uhusiano wa daktari na mgonjwa pale hospitalini tunajua kwamba Luga ni kipengele kiku au kipengele muhimu sana uh, katika kumsaidia daktari kuweza uh, kutibu yule mgonjwa ama kuweza kumsaidia yule mgonjwa kukabiliana na tatizo lake. Na sola la uh, afya ya uzazi katika karne hii bado inaendelea kuwa sola la muhimu uh, na hivyo na vile vile inaendelea kuwa tishio kwa afya ya uma kwa sababu tunakuzungumzia afya ya uzazi uh, tutakuwa tuna, uh, tunazungumzia magonjwa ya zinaa, tunazungumzia uh, aina za uh, uh, kansa mbalimbali mbali ambazo zinaathiri zina sehemu ya uzazi ya wanaume. Na tunajua kwamba uh, katika kawaida kuzungumzia uh, sehemu za siri uh, si jambo la kawaida kuzungumzia sehemu za siri wa aziwazi si jambo la kawaida hivi kwamba inachukuliwa kama ni lugabiko kuzungumzia hizi sehemu. Uh, kuna, uh, na tunazungumzia sehemu za siri tunazungumzia uh, e pengine tendo la kujamiana tunazungumzia e zile sehemu za mwili ambazo uh, uh, tun, uh, tunajua kwamba ni sehemu yeti uh, na hata utendakazi wa sehemu hizo na haya ni masuala ambayo yanasimamanishwa na utamaduni ni kutokana na utamaduni ambapo tunajua kwamba uh, maneno haya yanaweza ya kusemwa hadharani maneno haya hayawezi kusemwa hadharani Kwa hivyo uh, kazi hii inaangazia kwamba ikiwa basi kuna lugha mwiko ambapo kuna mambo ambayo hatuwezi kuyazungumzia hadharani kwa ajili ya utamaduni ambapo tumekulia basi je uh, uh, tunapotafuta huduma za afya ya uzazi ni lugha gani ambayo tutashika pale na utamaduni unaathiri zipi ile lugha hasa tunaangazia wanaume sababu tunajua kwamba uh, kulingana na na kwa kwamba wanawake watatumia watatumia tafida sana hali wanaume watatumia lugha ina makali ama watakosa sana kutumia tafida kwa wanaume wanaweza ya kawaida wanaweza kutumia tafida wanapata katika kutafuta hospitali mahitaji kubwa ya uzazi basi itakuwa ni lugha utatumia kwa lugha kwa lugha utakayotumia itakuwa lugha ya aina gani je utatumia utakutumia tafsiri tumi lugha ya kali kama wanavyofanya hali ya kawaida au watatumia tafsiri na je itakuwa kulia bila kidogo waeleza vipi kuteua lugha wataka dunia ziana na kazia vile vile katika
Uh, Melvin, Uma, sorry to interrupt you, but we are struggling a little bit to hear you. Um, I think most of us. Maybe it's better if you don't share, you put off your video and you just speak. It might be better. You, you might be saving on some bandwidth, uh, okay. battery, bandwidth, whatever it's called, bind. Band. Thanks. Yes. Okay, is, is that okay now? Uh, yes, it seems a little bit better now. For now. Okay, uh, can I start afresh? Um, I start afresh. Not sure we have enough time for starting completely, but uh, perhaps, yes, if you want to start maybe from some of the main points. Okay. Um, okay, I, I was saying that uh, this, this is what is... Uh, sorry, okay, now um, your connection is, is really bad. So I think if you have other devices around you, like maybe do you have a mobile on or something which is yeah. on, is interrupting with... with uh, what you're saying. So just, unajua nini, kama una simu ambayo laba umewasha pembeni yako au, au kama kuna, 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 kuna computer laba kama umewasha pembeni yako hapo. Zima kila kitu, ili yani ubaki yetu na nafasi hii ambayo uko hapa. Bila hivyo, kuna, 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 kuna kama sauti ya kama kufunja funja hivyo, ni kama atu, kama kuna mpasuo mpasuo nyuma yako. <laughs> Samahani kwa hilo sijui kama na sasa ninasikika. Okay. Laba amekuanzia hapo. Endelea tu lakini huna haja kuanza mwanzo. Endelea. Asante. Uh, yeah, you got another 15 minutes. 13 minutes. Ah uh, kwa hivyo nilikuwa na kama nilivyoelezea kazi hii inaangazia mawasiliano katika muktadha wa hospitali ambapo tunaangazia wanaume wana, wanapowasiliana na daktari katika kutafuta huduma za afya ya uzazi je wanatumia lugha ya aina gani na utamaduni walimokulia unaathiri vipi lugha wanayoitumia uh, na hivyo uh, tukaangazia haya mazungumzo katika muktadha halisi na uta, uh, kazi hii unatokana na uh, mawazo kwamba katika jamii kwa kawaida kuna baadhi ya mambo ambayo hatuwezi kuyazungumzia waziwazi yanachukuliwa kuwa ni lugha mwiko kwa hivyo ikiwa ni lugha mwiko kuzungumzia sehemu za siri waziwazi utendakazi wao basi katika muktadha ambapo mtu anapaswa kutaja yale masuala ili aweze kusaidiwa kiafya itakuwa ni vipi uh, pia tunatumia mawazo kwamba uh, kwa kawaida wanaume wanapozungumza wanapen, wanatumia uh, wanapenda kutumia lugha waziwazi ilivyo haswa miongoni mwao uh, watu, wanakwepa sana kutumia tasfida uh, uh, kwa kiingereza tunaita euphemism kwa hivyo tunajiuliza katika muktadha wa hospitali wanahitaji huduma za afya ya uzazi je watatumia tasfida kwa sababu ya utamaduni au je watazungumza lugha ile waziwazi uh, watasema kwamba uh, watataja sehemu hizo ambazo wanahisi kwamba wana tatizo waziwazi na kazi hii inatokana na mazingira halisia ambapo daktari na mgonjwa wanazungumza katika muktadha halisi wa hospitali uh, nitataja kwamba uh, uh, idhini yote ilipatikana kabla ya kwanza ukusanyaji wa data hii na ndiposa uh, uh, mazungumzo ya daktari na mgonjwa ikaweza kurekodiwa na ilibainika kwamba katika kuzungumza na daktari uh, wanaume baadhi ya wanaume walitumia tasfida kwa mfano iwapo mgonjwa wa kiume alikuja pale na uh, na tatizo ambalo linaashiria kuwa kidogo ana magonjwa ya zinaa basi ilitokea kwamba walitumia maneno kama vile daktari uh, niliposhiriki uh, 
ngono na msichana fulani akanichoma kwa hivyo tunaona pale uh, badala ya kusema tatizo haswa anatumia neno kuchomwa an, ama ni kama istiari kuonyesha kwamba kidogo kuna athari fulani uh, kiafya ambayo imetokea katika sehemu yake ya siri kando na hiyo ungeona uh, pia tuligundua kwamba uh, kuna baadhi kuna mgonjwa fulani ambaye alikuwa anamwambia daktari i have a problem in my whatever kwa hivyo in my whatever pale asemi waziwazi tatizo liko katika sehemu gani ya mwili na daktari anapomuuliza in your whatever unamaanisha una nini anamwambia daktari niliangukia pabaya hivi kuashiria kwamba uh, ni, uh, ni kama ameambukizwa uh, ugonjwa wa zinaa anaposema niliangukia pabaya ni kum, uh, uh, inachukuliwa kwamba uh, hii ni tasfida ama ni, ni istiari ya kuonyesha kwamba ameambukizwa ugonjwa alikuwa na ruhusa ya kusema waziwazi kwamba ilikuwa hivi nilifanya hivi na sasa nimeambukizwa ugonjwa huu lakini anaamua kutumia istiari kwamba niliangukia pabaya kwa hivyo tunaona kwamba pale kuna matumizi ya tasfida na hawa wagonjwa baadaye wanapo uh, katika mahojiano na mtafiti wanapoulizwa kwa nini wanaamua kutumia Uh, I have a problem in my whatever kwa nini wanaamua kuzungumzia niliangukia pabaya kwa nini wanachagua kusema akanichoma wanaeleza kwamba kulingana na kwao ama kulingana na walivyolelewa ni kwamba hawawezi uh, hawawezi kuzungumzia sehemu za siri waziwazi kwa hivyo wanalazimika kutafuta msamiati mbadala ambao katika hali hii tunaita tasfida ili kuweza kuelezea daktari uh, ni tatizo gani haswa ambalo uh, wako nalo uh, kisha pia kuna baadhi ya wanaume ambao haswa walipopata kwamba daktari ni wa kike waliamua kunyamaza na walipoulizwa swali tatizo ni nini uh, wanajibu uh, kwa neno moja au wananyamaza kabisa na ku, uh, kuinamisha kichwa ka, kia, kana kwamba wana swala la aibu na hivyo daktari anakuwa na uh, muda mgumu kuteua ku, 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 kumsaidia yule mgonjwa kwa sababu wanashindwa yule mgonjwa amenyamaza hazungumzi na hili lilitokezea haswa pale ambapo uh, daktari alikuwa wa kike na mgonjwa alikuwa wa kiume. Uh, tunaona kwamba pale ambapo kulitokea hali ambapo kuna mgonjwa wa kiume na daktari wa kiume uh, ita, uh, nitasema kwamba umri wao kidogo ulikuwa ni wa makamo tukaona hali ambapo yule mgonjwa anakuja na kusema daktari nyumba imeharibika. Na moja kwa moja daktari akawa ameelewa ni nini ambacho anakizungumzia. Alipokuwa anasema kwamba nyumba imeharibika anamaanisha kwamba uh, hana ule uwezo wa kushiriki ngono na mkewe kwa sababu huenda ana, ana erectile dysfunction kwa mfano kwa hivyo kwa kusema tu nyumba imeharibika ilionekana kwamba yule daktari alielewa moja kwa moja alichokuwa anazungumzia na katika mahojiano baadaye ilibainika kwamba daktari aliweza kuelewa moja kwa moja kwa sababu mwanzo alikuwa ni daktari wa kiume na huyu mgonjwa alitumia neno nyumba imeharibika kwa sababu kwanza ya umri wake kwa hivyo alikuwa uh, mwanaume wa umri wa miaka 44 kwa hivyo akawa hawezi kutamka waziwazi kwamba uh, uh, siwezi kufanya hivi na hivi na hivyo akaamua kutumia ile istiari kwamba nyumba imeharibika uh, ambayo tu, uh, tayari nimeshaeleza maana yake uh, kando na hayo pia tukagundua kwamba kuna uh, mgonjwa wa kiume ambaye alipokutana na daktari wa kike akasema waziwazi tatizo lake akasema kwamba daktari mimi nina shida in my dick na yule ni daktari wa kike. Kwa hivyo kulingana na tukiangalia swala la matumizi ya lugha kwa msingi wa mamlaka power, power relations uh, huenda ikawa aliamua kutumia lugha ya moja kwa moja kwa sababu yule ni daktari wa kike na hivyo hakutaka kumpa zile zile nguvu za kumuonyesha kwamba uh, pengine kwa sababu yeye ni daktari ana nguvu 
kumshinda lakini akatumia ile mbinu kama mwanamme kudhibiti yale mazungumzo na kuonyesha kwamba yeye ni mwanamme na katika mahojiano baadaye akaulizwa kwa nini alizungumza waziwazi akasema iwapo angetumia lugha nyingine basi yule daktari wa kike angemuona kama mtu hivi hivi yani si mwanamme kwa hivyo hiyo inadhibitisha kwamba kwanza alitaka kudhibiti yale mazungumzo kama mwanamme na hivyo kuonyesha uh, mamlaka katika mazungumzo na pili akataka kuonyesha kwa sababu ni mwanamme basi yule mwanamke hawezi uh, Ha, ha, hange ruhusu yule mwanamke amuone tu kama mtu wa kiwango cha chini. Kwa hivyo katika kumalizia ina na hayo machache kwa sababu ni kazi ambayo inaendelea data bado tunaendelea kukusanya. Uh, inaonekana kwamba utamaduni una athiri mkubwa katika uteuzi wa lugha. Uh, wale wagonjwa ambao kufikia sasa tumetumia data yao katika jukwa hili ni wazi kwamba walikuwa wanaamua kutumia tasfida ama kukwepa kutaja yale maneno waziwazi wazi kwa sababu ni utamaduni wao kulingana na maelezo yao wa, 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 kulingana na maelezo yao wangesema kwetu ama tulikolelewa kwa hivyo kuonyesha kwamba utamaduni wao una athiri mkubwa katika lugha wanayoteua katika muktadha yoyote na katika hali hii ilikuwa ni muktadha ya hospitali ambapo walikuwa wanatafuta huduma za afya uh, asante na shukuru samahani kwa tatizo la teknolojia ambalo limetokea asante <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, no, we're sorry uh, of the technicalities. These things happen these days with Zoom. Uh, as um, I was, um, I said as well before, if you could perhaps share your presentation uh, with us by email, then we will, uh, we will send it to the attendees. Um, if that's okay, you can email it to us. Um, okay, so now we can open yeah. the... Yeah, is that okay, um, Melvin Huma? Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, stay with us. Uh, we are now opening the, um, the floor for the Q&A. Uh, yes, there are two ways the, to ask, ask your questions. If you want to speak, uh, please raise your hand and we will enable you to, to speak. Otherwise, you can put your question in the Q&A chat. There is one, in fact, already. Um, there is a question from Chege Gichiora. Uh, is a question about slave names Aibu. Um, so I take it this is uh, for um, Salvatore. And um, if you want to answer this question to Chege, shall we do one by one uh, as we are waiting for more to come in? Uh, Chege, actually, we if you want to, to uh, ask, we allow you to talk. <laughs> yeah, right. I like to much. speak. So Chege, there you go. You, uh, now I've sorted my video as well, if you want to save it, but that's fine. Now, I have a quick one about, um, first of all, uh, I was fascinated by the, uh, the talk about uh, slave names and naming system uh, names and Hilo uh, Swalala uh, Aibu. It has, I would like to ask, a, uh, to ask something about the names because this relates a lot to some of the work I did on Afro-Mexicans. Uh, I've really followed a very similar methodology as has been described um, by studying the archives. Uh, in this case, I looked at the archives of the Indies in, in Sevilla, Spain. And um, my interest was to stress the origins of people of African descent who are now Mexicans. And I found bountiful evidence of the, name, the names which reflected by and large similar to that lady who called herself, was it uh, uh, Selma Unyamwezi? Uh, I think that was the name. Um, I found very many names such as Domingo Angola, Juan Nicolas Matamba, Juan Congo, Juan Biafara, obviously from uh, West, from Nigeria, Francisco Jolofo, Jolofo in Spanish meant referred to the Wolof, and so on. Now, this naming practice was particularly peculiarly Spanish. And my interest in this is that since we know very shortly before 
the Spanish became, began to engage in Africa in trans, transatlantic slavery very early in the, in the day, you know, late 16th century. They had just come out of a very long relationship, if you want to call it so, occupation of Southern Spain by the Arabs, you know, who, who they call the Moors, the Moros. So there, is a, there were very many practices that the Spanish took up from the Arabs, especially to do with slavery. And I'm wondering if the, the researchers here would be keen to find out a bit more. Although, of course, it has been said that many of the slaves found it uh, were not able today, and therefore they want to discard their name, the, 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 the slave names. I wonder if there would be more evidence of the origins of many of these <laughs> former slaves perhaps reflected in the names such as Unyamwezi, would it be possible to trace, uh, to use this method or this approach to find out a lot more about the origins of those uh, slaves who were taken up by the Arabs? If not, I mean, I don't know if this is a question, it's more like a suggestion perhaps, especially because I heard that the paper is still in progress, that might be uh, something, and I would be very, very fascinated also to, uh, to, to read the paper uh, when it's developed, and also to share uh, a bit of this experience because I, there are lots of similarities uh, here involved. Uh, thank you, I'll stop there. Maybe you can get a comment. Thank you, Chege. Uh, Salvatore, would you like to answer now? Um, if you can hear us. I'm not sure, maybe Salvatore has some uh, technical issues as well, because he was having some earlier. I'm not sure if he's there, is he here with us. Um, while we wait, ah, there you go, there you go, thank you. Excellent. Oh, thank you. Uh, um, hello, Angelica. Uh, hello, are you getting me? Yes, the, yes. did you hear, did hear, you hear you. the question from uh, oh, okay. Laura? So, uh, Chege, thank you so much for uh, for your question about slavery and Aibu, and uh, I would also uh, I would also be glad uh, uh, to read your papers about about the subject matter. Of course, um, and uh, of course, I should also declare my interest that um, I have been working on Unyamwezi for uh, for for more than five years. So I did my MA and PhD about slavery and uh, creation of, 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 of Christian communities in Western Tanzania. And, the po uh, and I'm currently a postdoctoral fellow uh, working under the direction of Professor Felista Sibeika. Uh, so in fact, in Unyamwezi, uh, talking about slavery uh, is not a topic that, uh, uh, that elders and the society at large would, would be interested. And very often, uh, researchers find themselves in uh, in trouble uh, when finding um, um, information about about slavery because it is a topic that uh, uh, that would not attract attention of um, of elders and uh, and members of the uh, and members of the community at large. So, the only methodology that I used um, in um, uh, digging deeper into 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 slavery and Aibu was uh, first of all to use uh, the the archives as you have also rightly pointed out, and uh, but also second uh, using family histories as a unit of analysis where I could also I could also I could also go back uh, two generation back uh, I could also go beyond uh, the present generation. So as, in reference to the certificates of freedom, uh, which I have, uh, which I came across, and which I've also in fact been reading uh, from the archives of Western Tanzania, uh, they, 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 they they indicate the names of slaves who joined who joined the Christian communities uh, indicate their origins, and it is no wonder to find. Uh, from the from the certificates of freedom, names like Mubembe, yeah, suggesting that uh, the particular slave originated from Eastern DRC. It is also uh, very often uh, to find names 
like mlekwa or kalekwa, which means an abandoned person or an orphan. So a perusal of the certificates of almost of more than 150 certificates of freedom uh, granted to slaves, uh, which are deposited in, uh, in, in the archives of Western Tanzania, uh, indicates um, origins of, 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 of slaves who joined the uh, mission communities. But second, I, I also, I also, I also um, uh, read um, baptismal registers of adult uh, Christians, of, 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 of adult Christians uh, from 1908 to 1934. But I also uh, came across uh, baptismal registers of, um, of children uh, between the 1920s and 1940s. Now, by looking at the list of names who joined missions, the missions of, 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 um, of the Moravians, especially the Moravians in Western Tanzania, we can certainly, uh, we can certainly tell and uh, tell the, uh, the origin or the slave antecedent of, uh, of, of, of a particular uh, former slave. Because uh, for the Moravians, they used the Nyamwezi culture of naming. And now for the Nyamwezi, uh, naming works as follows. When a person is born, or a baby is born, he uh, is uh, given the birth name in Kiswahili Jina Lauji. And then followed by a Christian name. And uh, the last name now becomes his or her father's name. So the, the missionaries uh, who uh, invited, uh, uh, who uh, accepted um, the formerly enslaved people who joined uh, uh, missions, they relied on this, on the pre-existing culture of naming. For instance, my first name is Salvatore, but in Unyamwezi, I would have... Uh, my birth name, which would uh, would be something beyond Salvatore, and Salvatore would be the second name, and Nyanto becomes my third name, which is also my father's name. So by looking at, by going through the baptismal register, which details names of, uh, of early Christians, we can certainly tell all birth names had a slave antecedents. And, 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 and what is also important, uh, the last column, of the baptismal register had also additional comment, which missionaries, uh, missionaries in fact wrote. They, they would write that, okay, this is a, a mudugu va vusese, a kinyamwezi, meaning that this particular slave is a descendant of, is either a slave, was either, either a slave or a descendant of a formerly enslaved person. So, I used this as uh, as the uh, uh, the strategy of 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 of, 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 um, of first of all identifying names that had slave antecedents, and what was also important is that uh, in due course these names were in fact discarded. They were gotten rid of because uh, because uh, because uh, 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 the first generation. Of Christians who joined the mission uh, uh, missions mission communities. Uh, so sorry, of, I'm yes. sorry to interrupt you, but uh, I have to. I have so many other questions, and we okay. have the time. Sorry, I know it's so interesting what you are talking about, and we would really like to continue. But oh, okay, okay. Sorry. Thank you. Um, I have sent. A, I have sent a quick comment to Salvatore on the chat, please. Uh, just yeah, so have a look. I, I don't even see it. Oh. Uh, yeah, okay. I, I, I can't read it. You need to put it, it in the Q&A uh, box. Oh. Uh, oh, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. 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 We can continue okay. talking All right. in, uh, perhaps toward the end of the day. We got still more I'm time. sure we will continue talking. Uh, thank thank you. you. But yeah, thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, no, I just wanted to move on to the other question, to the other panelists. Um, again, just being conscious of time. Uh, I have um, 
uh, four questions that I would like to take. I might be able to take three. Uh, there is one each. So the first question is to Inessa uh, from Helle Goldman. Uh, she says, I have a question about polygyny and public perception of it. Uh, so that's from Hel Goodman. Uh, Ellen, um, I think you also had your um, hand raised, so we allow, allow you to talk. You, perhaps you can be very brief uh, about your question to Inessa so that we have time to answer and go to other questions. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. I don't know if you can see me. Uh, no, yeah, we can't see you, but we can hear you. So yeah. Oh, okay, so that's fine. Yeah. That's all you need. Yeah. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, everybody for a lovely, lovely talk. Um, to be brief, I just want to say that um, in the States, there have been several reality TV shows uh, about polygynous families uh, in the last like, 10 years or so. And this has really opened up uh, public conversations about polygyny, which is illegal in the States. Um, although the laws vary from, from state to state about how much it's, uh, how harshly it's uh, prosecuted. So these TV shows have elicited a lot of conversation, uh, a lot of debate, and it's also led to a lot of polygynous people, as it were, coming out of the closet. Um, and it's also changed a lot of um, people's perceptions, a lot of people who are not polygynous. It's changed their ideas about polygyny. And I just wonder if there is anything similar in the UK. Yeah, so I, I think I know about the shows you're talking about. Is it um, like Sister Wives and them? I remember I used to watch them a lot. That's so, one of them, yeah. There's been several, that's the original one, yeah. Yeah, it's very different the situation in the UK overall because um, in, in the US and, so, and I suppose parts of Canada as well, you've got that as a practice traditionally. But in the UK, it's coming more from outside, from immigrants, yeah? Right. So the perception is that, um, in, I mean, even if uh, it's, it's going to be long, so I'm not going to go into it, but even um, why they brought in the marriage act was to avoid such things. And yeah, so the, the perception is very different. It's not acceptable generally. Even the women I interviewed, the Zanzibaris, to who were there from, it's very acceptable, yeah? But over here, the, you know, they, they can't really tell their friends, their English friends or other foreign friends that, you know, I'm in a polygamous marriage, yeah? They can't. They'd rather even say, you know, it was a one night stand or something, or they'll say, you know, I've got a husband, but nobody will see him. But um, so to the, um, to the community in England, they, they're not going to talk about, you know, the fact that they're in a polygamous marriage. They might tell others and Zibaris, but um, also they say they do face a lot of uh, stigma, even from their families sometimes now. <laughs> unlike what the older generation went through and uh, even from the in-laws so yeah that's some of the people um but yeah the situation is very different i think in the u.s canada compared to here because in the u.s and canada you have that traditionally i mean the the english people moved and settled there many many generations ago that's you know the, the, the that practice but over here it's more from more from the recent immigrants that we're seeing it thank you yeah <laughs> Sorry, here I am. Uh, suddenly my screen went. I'm just trying to go to the... Um, okay, thank you so much for your, for your question. Now I have a question for Shabani from uh, uh, Tafik Alamedi. Um, he's saying, I was hoping to hear more about what is the composition of the different kind of Muslim uh, comprising the activists invested in the reintroduction of the Qadi courts. And how do they position themselves in relation to narratives circulating online about distrust of some segments of the Muslim community <laughs> towards Muslim government entities like Bakwata? What different visions uh, of how the Qadi codes could operate have been put forward? Question mark. Um, yes, that's it. Well, uh Thank you, Taufik. Uh, maybe in a brief, I would say that the composition of the Muslim who are trying to, the Muslim activists who are involved in the general process of the, the demand for the introduction of the caste code is kind of vague, you know, because as we know, there are these known big labels for Muslim, for example, let's say Sunni, Shia, maybe Salafi, or radicals, or Islamist. But 
In Tanzania, you don't find people being identified as such. And that's where also the problem start. And in this case, from my point of view now, I would say we have like four groups of uh, Muslim who are trying to demand for the introduction of Kathis court. And this also is my understanding from most of my inter interlocutors that I've been trying to talk to. For example, they are saying that one of this group is what they call uh, devoted Muslims. So in Swahili say, waisilamu wachamungu. And to put it in the perspective that each group has its own reasons why they want their introduction of the Kazi court. So for example, uh, devoted Muslims just want the the introduction of the Kazi court so that they can go to the Islamic foundations to have all the decision made by the Kazi, all their problems, adjudication in the Kazi court. But the other group, which of course I call them as the critical thinkers, uh, so Waisilam uh, Tafakuri, so critical thinkers. And this is a group of majority of the activists come from these groups. They are not that much devoted to Muslims but well-educated, employed in the government, you know, people in the political parties, those. And this group bring out political reasons and a number of religious reasons too. For example, some want the, the introduction of the Kazi court because they want it to, to be the major unifying factor among the Muslim and those, not those these entities that we're talking about like Bakwata, like Ibarazaku, which are there to unify the Muslim. And the, the other one is what we call uh, Muslim Waisilam Maslai. Now, this, the English of this one is a bit more tricky because you can't say, uh, well, but I've, I found it difficult to, to find exact English word to say about this, but we don't call Waisilam Maslai. For this, they want also Muslim to have equal opportunities in the government, for example, employment. So they know that if the Kazi court will be introduced, there'll be Muslim who employed in the government as Kazis and as officers in the Kazi court in general. I hope I tried to answer on the part of the composition. On the, the position of people in the circulation of people, the start of Abakwata, this is, this is, uh, a very complicated area because people, mixed feelings happen this. Why? Because the first problem is Bakwata now is the only organ which is accepted by the government. So for the majority of the Muslim, for them to get some services as a Muslim, they have at least have Bakwata recognition in a way. So in a way, some support Bakwata because they have their own interest. But at the same time, they oppose Bakwata because they feel that Bakwata is trying to dominate the field among Muslims, which of course is not their like, because they feel that Bakwata is just an institution equals to other several other institutions of Muslim that exist. For example, the Ansari Sunnah, uh, the uh, Barazaku and al Salati Islamia, for example, all those are institutions. So they say Bakwata is just an institution. It shouldn't have been given them uh, the, the big share of power over the Muslim association while it says it has equal status with other Muslim associations. So th there's a mixed feelings about that. And you can't really discern what sides people are. And on the last part, on how the Kazi court should operate, well, some people feel that Kathi court should be incorporated in the Tanzanian judicial system at the lower stage, being given its apparent powers up to the top, as it is in Zanzibar that you have the lower and the, the you have the lower stage and the apparent power under the Mufti in Zanzibar and the, the, the chief Kathi. But some feel that Kazi court should be established as an independent judicial system. So it shouldn't be part of the existing judicial system but it should be an independent uh, part of the uh, of its own power with its own structure and that. So until today, there is also disagreement among Muslims themselves, how they want Kazi courts to operate. Uh, maybe that will be in short. And if you have any question, yes. you can, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there was a question uh, for, I think it's been answered already. Uh, there was a question for Melvin uh, from Nazra Bibu. Uh, perhaps I can just read it out uh, because I'm not sure that uh, people can see your answer, Melvin. So if you don't mind, I will just quickly uh, read it with my sort of not so good Swahili, but hopefully. Uh, in afamika kuwa wanaume wanatamka wazi wazi maneno fiche pale wanapokuwa sehemu eh, zisizo ramsi au wakiwa wenyewe je hili unalieze eh, zaje eh, melvin would you like to answer uh, to everybody um, because i think uh, not everybody has seen the answer yes but briefly Thank you. Uh, kwa hivyo, uh, kulingana na hili swali, uh, ni, ni kweli kwamba wanaume wanapokuwa peke yao au katika ma, uh, mazingira isiyo rasmi, wao huzungumza maneno fiche waziwazi. Wazi. And this is a fact that I established during my MA research. Uh, this is what I was looking for and that was a finding. Uh, basi ninalielezaje, nina Kumba, this is the argument that formed the basis of this study. Uh, Huu ndio msingi wa kazi hii. Kwamba ikiwa katika sehemu zisizorasmi au wakiwa peke yao wanazungumza maneno fiche waziwazi. <coughs> Baki wakijipata katika muktadha rasmi kwa mfano hospitalini wata, wata, watazungumza waziwazi au watatumia lugha nyingine. Na hili sana sana litategemea moja utamaduni walimokulia je utamaduni walimokulia unaeleza vipi kwamba katika muktadha fulani utatumia lugha ya aina gani na pili itatege, ya, katika kazi hii ilitegemea uh, jinsia ya daktari I, ina, uh, iligunduliwa kwamba katika ikiwa daktari ni wa kike walikwepa kutumia lugha ya waziwazi lakini ikiwa daktari alikuwa wa kiume walitumia lugha ya waziwazi kwa sababu uh, daktari ni mwanamume mwenzake uh, asante uh, okay thank you so much thank you very much uh, basically we come to the end of the panel now uh, we are going to have a, a lunch break uh, there are no more questions as well, so I think we're closing um, this panel. Uh, we are now going to have uh, a 30 minutes lunch break, and uh, uh, therefore, yes, do take um, you know take a little rest, but do come back at 2 p.m. on panel three uh, for the speakers. Uh, as you know, you should have received your personalized link, uh, and for the audience. Uh, please do uh, sign up unless you've done so yet. Uh, do sign up to the panel three. And uh, yes, unless either you want to say anything at this point. I think I can see a hand. Is that a hand, Inessa, or is that an old thing? No, it's me. I just wanted to, um, I have a quick question. I know there isn't my time for Shabani, but that might link my topic with his. Yeah, please go <laughs> ahead. Yeah, so um, I know that with the LMA, for example, uh, with polygamous marriages there's been an issue where with property division mm -hmm. the fact that uh, when property is divided mm -hmm. let us say there's, there's a divorce yeah and yeah. one wife uh, files for divorce yeah mm -hmm. and the property would be divided between those two a co-wife is not able to join that that court case yeah so it mm -hmm. becomes unfair for the co-wives because that property that's shared let's say between the husband and four wives is divided to two people and the wives the other wives will only get when they file for divorce they'll only get half of what that man got maybe or less you get what i'm trying to say well yes. that's an issue historically as well that was seen or is it just an issue that's coming up now mm -hmm. no it is coming up now and it was there before now most of the court's decision was that they'll first determine the time that a wife will spend with a husband Mm -hmm. and they tried to determine at that particular time what kind of property was acquired. Then it's only that property that will be divided on the, between the husband and, that, and, and the wife that is seeking divorce. Now, but also this is complicated because at the same time, if you look at the time they spend together, that means there is a contribution for both wives. Mm -hmm. 
Well, sometimes the court is very dismissive on deciding that. And sometimes it takes a long approach of trying to divide everything among each and every member of the society, of the family, and try to divide. So there is no defined really way that the court can take. And there is this debate among the, uh, the legal officers themselves, the judges and magistrates, in how to decide things like that. So I think it's still a, a puzzle to everybody yet. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, great, thank you so much. Uh, yes, we just want to sort of reiterate again that we understand is not the ideal conference, the ideal Baraza in the way we understand Baraza. Uh, we are, but on the other side, uh, for us, it was either this way or nothing. So we thought, let's just do it this time and see how it goes in this world of post pandemic, still pandemic going on. So yes, we do apologize that uh, not everybody would feel able to participate, but, you know, we are all here and, you know, we are very grateful to everybody that made it today. And, um, you know, everything will be recorded, it will be available online afterwards. And then, uh, yes, we really hope sincerely that next year we will be able to uh, see each other again, face to face. Um, so, yes, uh, let me just double check. Uh, maybe there is, uh, no, I think, um, Ah, yes, there was just a little comment uh, about the next panel. Perhaps I'll say that now. Uh, one of the panelists in panel three, Teresa Poeta, she just saying that uh, ahead of our presentation on Swahili variation in the next panel, we would love to know what Swahili dialects or varieties you know of. Can you share them with us using the link below? Can you see the link? Uh, probably not. I'm going to put this all, uh, this all, into also the chat uh, for everybody so that we are all on the same. There you go. I think you've seen that now. And if you have uh, during lunch time, if you don't mind clicking on the link sent by Teresa to add some of your, um, um, some of the variation of Dali that uh, you know of. Um, so that would be great. Okay, I think we can now, uh, yes, I think the link is gonna, break pretty soon so um we just uh, close the panel thank you so much everyone um and uh, we will uh, come back we'll see you in half an hour please uh, stay stay with us uh, for the following two panels and uh, thank you again thank you thank you thank very you. much thank you very much thank you i right, see you shortly thank you bye 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 thank you so much Thanks. bye presentation they were amazing thank you very much yes okay. brilliant and again please uh okay use the q a kuna hii q a ambayo mnaweza mkauliza maswali hakuna chat samahanini sana na pia hata hakuna video kama kawaida ya zoom lakini hii ndio njia mpya ya soas na mara nyingi taasisi zinakuwa zinafanya maamuzi ambayo labda si ya kiswahili lakini angalau tunapata kuonana kwa njia moja au nyingine au sio Good to see you, Anissa. Hello. Thank you, Salama. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you.